um, let me uh, warmly welcome our fantastic keynote speaker, Ken Sarrett. Now, uh, Ken is the Joseph Lady Professor in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology at UPenn. And he's also the director of the Institute of um, Regenerative Medicine. So he knows about all these aspects. And of course, he's the keynote speaker because he has made seminal and pioneering contributions to the field of reprogramming. And speaking about pioneering, one of the pioneering contributions is of course about the pioneer transcription factor and their function in direct reprogramming. And not to take too much time, I'd rather give the word, a word to Ken and we are looking very much forward to the latest exciting news from your lab. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank Magdalena, Thomas, and Deepak for the invitation, along with David Stewart, whom I've known for many years, uh, the invitation to give this talk. I also want to give a shout out to Terry Grodziker. My understanding is that many of you are actually new to Cold Spring Harbor, and Terry was managing a lot here at Cold Spring Harbor with the meetings and editor-in-chief of Genes and Development. And there was an amazing issue of Genes and Development earlier this year for those of us who published quite a few papers there, including myself, as well as those of us, including myself, who got quite a few papers rejected. So it goes both ways. But at any rate, check it out because it's a nice historical view of the field as well as Terry's contribution. All right, so the... Uh, the title of the symposium, or, or the, I'm sorry, the, the meeting is about cell state conversions. And in the interest of provoking discussion, if not argument, I'd like to actually try to distinguish what in my mind would be a cell state change and a cell fate change. If, and I hope I'm not being too semantic, but as you'll see, there's a functional part of this. So at any rate, I view cell fate changes as what occurs in development and what we uh, elicit when we do cell reprogramming and things like that. And cell state changes kind of, for me, talk more about uh, homeostasis, physiologic demand, the ability of cells to receive signals and change what they do without changing their fate. And so we can put all of this in the context of how um, tissue damage and regeneration occurs where stem cell populations may get activated in response to the part on the right and um, elicit a cell fate change. And then, again, there's aging and cancer. And we're, we're going to be touching on all of these topics uh, throughout the rest of the week. Underlying all of these transitions, in my view, is chromatin. And Mo many people focus on promoters and enhancers, as well I do, which are the active parts of the genome. They're hypersensitive to nucleases, transposase, and so forth. But as shown by ENCODE, who quantified over 100 different genomes by their epigenetic states, the, open, the really hypersensitive parts of chromatin are only a few percent of the genome, and maybe 20% of the so is mildly open, let's say, chromatin and transcribed. But the vast majority of the chromatin is transcriptionally silent and either what could be called naive, bound by linker histone to help keep it silent, or truly heterochromatic, uh, typically marked by H3K9 trimethyl and H3K27 trimethyl. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. So uh, in my view, Certainly, a cell fate change involves how regulatory proteins contend with all the stuff on the right-hand side there, you know, the 80% of the genome that's silent. How do you turn that on? And a way to think about it is that you're not just turning on genes for your other cell fate, but consider that the genes that are kept silent <clears throat> might be antithetical to the starting cell fate. <coughs> and truly need to be kept silent because they would disrupt the cell fate. For example, uh, proteins that cause cell-cell adhesion would not be welcome 
in a free-floating cell, uh, blood cell that um, didn't need to have an epithelial cell protein uh, expressed in it and so forth. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is just show you experimental evidence from my lab and others about this very clear distinction. And that is shown here. So Roque Bort, when he was a postdoc in my lab, um, identified three particular phases of early liver bud development. So there was the hepatic endoderm or hepatoblast that got induced as shown in blue, uh, marked by hex lax Z in this experiment. Uh, and the endoderm is shown with an orange nuclei that express FOXA2. And then there's liver bud emergence, a phase of interkinetic nuclear migration that allowed that endoderm to kind of burst out. And then finally, there's organogenesis um, involving vasculogenesis. And um, Junil Jung, when he was a student in my lab, um, figured out that receptor tyrosine kinase signaling uh, was one of two signals that induced, oh, eh. I'm not going to use a pointer. Thanks. Um, thank you, though. So he, he figured out that receptor tyrosine kinase signaling, and um, as we also showed BMP signaling, impinging upon a domain of endoderm, changed the cell fate to make liver and made hepatic endoderm. And that's been a robust finding. It works for ES cell differentiations that are done today. And then we also found, though, that later, um, um, Kunio Matsumoto, when he was visiting my lab, found that receptor tyrosine kinase signaling acted more as a morphogen to induce liver bud growth and va from, uh, with vasculogenesis. So the bottom line is you could activate all the RTK that you wanted on the right-hand side, and you weren't going to change the cell fate. And that's a typical example in my mind of how uh, you can induce a cell fate based on you know, the competence of the cells on the left. But once that's done, it's locked in. And now you're um, responding to homeostatic or other kinds of signals that um, impinge upon a cell fate. The other point I want to make is that this is not a continuous, um, a, a sudden jump. But there's an intermediate state, a metastable state from the genetics. And Roque had figured out that in the hex mutant, when you did not express the hex gene, in fact, the hepatic endoderm got induced perfectly well. All the markers we could look at were there. But the cells then, at this middle stage, would revert and become gut endoderm. They would become the gut. <clears throat> and similarly, um, Chris Wright and Ray McDonald showed for PTF1A and P48 Mutants of those, you would induce the ventral pancreas, but then it would just fail, and those cells were still there. They're not, not dying off. They would switch over and become gut. Uh, NKX 3.2, same thing for the dorsal pancreas. And for those of you who prefer embryonic stem cells and single-cell RNA-seq approaches, a similar result was just published in DevCell by that lab, and they came to the same conclusion about HEX, that it was helping stabilize a metastable state. So to summarize and give my own perspective of this field that we're going to talk about, um, there's the concept of um, unstable, metastable states that are, that are required to induce a stable cell fate. But once you get there, it's pretty stable to the same kind of signals that induced it in the first place, which I find very interesting. And to be perfectly honest, I would just say, to some extent, a gap in the field is trying to understand how, you know, we're all, including my lab, we're studying chromatin and transcription factors and this and that, but trying to understand how signaling networks get rewired completely when you change cell fate is, is to me, a very interesting area. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is focus on um, overcoming barriers to cell fate changes, and I'm going to talk about what I consider, and most of you probably consider to be, the biggest cell fate changes around, which are first in the embryo, where pluripotent cells um, active or begin to activate pluripotent, the, the uh, zygote activates the genome, the zygotic genome, and becomes pluripotent, as well as reprogramming um, from somatic cells to IPS. And the lens that I'm going to bring to bear in most of my talks, after a bit more background, 
I'm just I'm going to present all new data that's not published. The lens is um, on a relatively new technique called single molecule tracking and observing aspects of the reprogramming process that we did not know about or anticipate and I think underlie a lot of it. And the inspiration for this actually comes from thinking about what goes on in the mammalian zygote to activate the zygotic genome. And there we've known for a long time from work by Mel de Pamphilus that there's different linker histones that ex exchange in and out. Um, Maria Elena Torres Perilla is going to talk about uh, changes in DNA replication and heterochromatin and all that. And what I think is interesting about it is that it's global changes. Now, by contrast, if we think about reprogramming the pluripotency based on the foundational work of Takahashi and Yamanaka, where Oxox, KLF, and MYC, ectopically expressed in a fibroblast or other types of cells, can induce the pluripotent cell, work from my lab, many others, Catherine Plath, um, Hans Scholler, et cetera, we've all focused on where the transcription factor binds, where chromatin opens, histone marks coming and going at particular sites. But I think what's been missing is trying to look at where there may be global changes in chromatin that uh, either accompany or are necessary for uh, the dramatic conversion of somatic cells to IPS and perhaps other cell fates as well. So um, underlying this, what, what gets the ball rolling? And we've put forth the idea that powerful gene regulatory proteins have their power by virtue of their ability to bind target sites on nucleosomes in compacted chromatin. Very simple. The fact that they don't need free DNA, opened up DNA uh, to do that. And so that's what we, how we define pioneer transcription factors. And in the time since then, they've been shown uh, by Abdenor Sufi to be important for reprogramming, but perhaps more importantly, important for uh, zygotic genome activation in work from Melissa Harrison's lab, Carl Wu, Antonio Giraldez, Hashibana, and, and various others. So what I consider to be a definitive experiment to address this, the, the underlying mechanism, was published recently by Abdenor, where he did a, a scan mutations across OCT4, which is one of the Yamanaka factors, and found a four amino acid deletion in one of the loops uh, in the HL, um, in, in one of the loops between the two DNA binding subtype domains, which had that mutation had no effect on DNA binding, but it, it prevented the factor from targeting a nucleosome or binding to a nucleosome in vitro. And that mutant was completely inefficient in inducing IPS. So to me, that shows nucleosome targeting is important. Okay, so. Um, UC Taipali's lab published a, a really beautiful study in Nature about five years ago uh, where they did a CLEX, a, a selection in vitro for different sequences on nucleosomes, and were able to discern at least five different types of binding to the nucleosome by different DNA binding domains. And Maylin Fernandez Garcia in my lab uh, also screened many human uh, transcription factors and came to the conclusion that you could predict if a factor would bind a nucleosome by whether the DNA binding domain basically grabbed the DNA along the long axis or grabbed it lightly, but didn't have to wrap around, because if it wrapped around, it would get in the way of the histones. So putting this all together uh, over the years, we think that um, this nucleosome binding allows nucleosome scanning so, you know, how does a factor know where to go? It's got to bounce around and, and check things out. And so um, we think that the, the scanning function is really crucial. And then uh, we and others have now shown that it results in displacement of an underlying linker histone. And this, we think, is transient. Um, it, can, it can happen and then reverse, and it doesn't really get locked in until other factors come in, such as nucleosome remodelers, as first shown by Carl Wu, and, um, and cooperative binding of other factors to, to create an open chromatin domain, or 
recruiting other factors that maybe make it more uh, closed or resistant. Okay, so um, this scanning business and displacement of linker histone is really the subject of today's talk, uh, as you'll see by the end. But um, as we get into the details of uh, the new work I'm going to present, I'm going to put it from this context, which is that work from Tom Mastelli 15 years ago now, <clears throat> and then various others, have shown that pluripotent cells have what is called hyperdynamic chromatin, which is to say that if you fuse GFP, or more recently HALO, tag single molecule tracking, and monitor the behavior, the movement of the core histone in nucleosomes, and you can distinguish uh, core histones that are in chromatin versus not by, by their movement. Um, what they've seen is that um, somatic cells have heterochromatin and much more confined movement behaviors of, link, of core histones, <clears throat> whereas pluripotent cells the core histones are much more dynamic. And then that was also shown for iPS cells. So what we would like to do is assess this kind of process during reprogramming. And the way we do this is prevailing upon a fusion of the HALO enzyme, which binds JF549, a very, very intense um, substrate when it's acted upon by HALO, and that was developed by Luke Levis at Genalia Farms. And you can basically track nucleosome movement because you can discern where you have free molecules of H2B versus nucleosomal, as you'll see in a minute. And we use a highly inclined and laminated optical uh, sheet microscopy. So you're coming in at a very, very shallow angle with the incident light and looking at fluorescence coming down this way. And so we can track movements of molecules in real time over a 200 nanometer depth of the nucleus. And uh, on the left is Mei Shima, who's done a lot of nice work in this area. And um, basically, him and others have shown that there's confined Brownian movement of chromatin, as you would expect. And this is work on the right from Jonathan Lerner, a postdoc who was a postdoc in my lab uh, from a few years ago. Um, looking at live movement of H2B. So this is in now a somatic cell, uh, a hepatic cell line that we had made. And as you can see, the nucleus is a busy place. These things are moving around. The first time you see this, I have to tell you, it's, it's transformative because you go, no, it can't be, but it is. So John's a very clever guy, very creative and he came up with uh, the following adaptation. So he was developed programs to track the movements in a single nucleus over a 50-second period, let's say, many thousands. And then he would get these paths. This is now flattened down to 2D. But you could, by using controls of molecules we know that are not binding to chromatin, you could distinguish freely diffusing tracks of H2B from um, tracks that were involved in, in nucleosomes. And then what he did was he, he developed a two-parameter model. And the idea was for each track, he measured the average displacement of each movement, and he plotted that against the radius of confinement, like sort of how confined it is, or was it moving around like that, and was able to discern or distinguish low mobility nucleosomes from high mobility nucleosomes. And this was all published three years ago and he has a star protocol on the technology. So if you look in a hepatic cell line, you can see low mobility chromatin around the nuclear periphery, which makes sense because that's where it's enriched for H3K9 dimethyl um, heterochromatin, as well as inside the nucleus. And there's also high mobility chromatin. And in his paper, he had also mapped where HP1 halo tag and SUV39 H1 halo tag move, how they move in the nucleus. And he could see um, an enrichment for low mobility states for those heterochromatin proteins in contrast to many transcription factors and other proteins that did not. So 
uh, we could then quantify, if you will, the difference between the low mobility uh, and versus high mobility forms of nucleosomes in, in fibroblasts versus pluripotent cells. And as you would expect, we see many more high mobility states in the um, IPS cells here, um, based on that initial work uh, from Nestelli and Aaron Mesheror. So really the question then that we're arriving to is, when and how is this hyperdynamic chromatin induced? Okay. So uh, we know that in the first few days, the somatic cells begin to lose their identity by gene expression and where transcription factors are bound. Um, there's sporadic turning on of pluripotency markers. It's not homogeneous. And based on work a long time ago from uh, Rudolf Janisch and Yossi Boganim, as well as uh, Abdenur in my lab, uh, it was pretty clear, at least to us at the time, that but around two weeks in in the human reprogramming, uh, the cells entered a deterministic path to reprogramming because they found you were activating these so-called late genes uh, that were required for the cells to continue on the path to reprogram. And Abdenor had found that those genes resided in H3K9 trimethyl heterochromatin. So, uh, so let's think about what could be happening when. We know that the Yamanaka factors bind within a couple days. They create hypersensitive sites. There's enhancer decommissioning. Again, all of this is based on looking at individual sites across the genome and then the uh, overcoming the chromatin impediments. So our money was on uh, things really happening by day 14. So how do we look at this? So Jing Chao Zhang, um, another postdoc in my lab, collaborated with John, and they developed the following uh, approach, all right? So here we're looking at day zero, where we transduce into the cells a Sendai virus preparation. That's the same prep that our IPS core uses all the time. So it's nothing special, no more, no less. This is what the core has determined makes good IPS cells. And so during the period at day four and seven, Jing Chao found conditions where he could stain the live cells and see which were the few that were expressing the early marker of reprogramming, SSEA4, or the late market marker of reprogramming. And later I'm gonna use a different marker. And so we could see which are the rare cells very early that are on the path to reprogramming versus the ones that are not. And then we would drop in an H2B halo lentivirus two days before imaging. So then we could image at different time points. And so now the question is, along this path from day 4, 7, 14, and 21, when do we see this hyperdynamic chromatin turning on? if you will. And I didn't even believe the answer. You know, it's like, go back to the lab and do it again a few more times. But the bottom line is, within four days, we saw this global decompaction uh, occurring in both the, SSCA, the rare SSCA4 positive cells at the time, as well as the SSCA4 minus cells at the time. So what this means is that when you dump these pioneer factors into cells and you overexpress them, you're tickling the chromatin in a global way. It's a global change. Um, and then, okay, what happens by day seven and beyond? Surprise to us. Number two, by a couple days later, three days later, the SSCA4 minus cells have reverted back to the compact chromatin. Just whoop. And uh, then if we keep going, all right, what we observed, you'll note the SSCA4 positive cells at day seven have a perimeter of blue uh, compacted chromatin, and that's kind of lost by day 14. So there's multiple things going on here. There's an early phase of a global change, and that rapidly reverts in the cells that are not going to be reprogramming and is maintained in the cells that are. And so what I think is what all of a sudden this fits with is when we got our original data looking at um, where OXOX, KLF, and MYC bind within the first two days, the vast majority of binding events were not at sites that occurred in uh, ES cells. And thankfully, other labs have replicated the same result. 
And so, you know, are they really doing something direct and, me direct and mechanistic at those targets? Or is that just part of some global change that's going on? Um, and so another thing that's kind of interesting about this, and I think Juan Carlos Ipsizua Belmonte will talk about it, is the idea that um, pulsing ox, ox, and KLF in cells may be able to rejuvenate them. Now, uh, Serrano, a number of years ago, had expressed all four of them in mice and got teratomas, no surprise. But the more recent work has been to sort of pulse them. And what I want to suggest is that maybe it's got nothing to do with a specific e effect of those factors, but maybe it's, it's just the global uh, nonspecific um, consequence. All right, so what's going on underneath all of this? Uh, what's happening to the chromatin, if you will? And so um, there's two basic classes of repressed chromatin. There's K9 trimethyl, polycomb heterochromatin, and there's K9 trimethyl. Both give rise to transcriptional silence. Both of them uh, can differ between different cell types. I'd like to uh, point you away from the idea that the K9 is constitutive. It's, it is at repeat elements, but not at protein coding genes. Uh, and the polycomb flavor uh, allows binding by more transcription complexes, poise genes, and so forth, where the K9 um, seems to be more restrictive of that. And Danny Reinberg and Lynn Vales have a nice, thoughtful piece talking about how these two marks are really the only, if you will, or main epigenetic marks in the sense that the enzymes that promote these uh, read out what they have just done and, and keep going in a feed-forward way. Okay, so why is my lab so interested in the K9 form, and how does that relate to what we're looking at today? So uh, going back again to 2012, when Abdenor was in the lab, and we ectopically expressed the Yamanaka factors and did chip seek within 48 hours of their expression and found many, many sites where they bound, and they bound nucleosomal sites first, oxox and KLF did, et cetera, et cetera. But what we noticed was that each vertical line on, on the plot on the upper right uh, represents an individual binding event. And this is 40 million base pairs of DNA going across there, so it's a lot of binding events. But there are these gaps. Uh, where the factors were not bound, and that corresponded to H3K9 trimethyl heterochromatin, whereas in ES cells, those domains were not heterochromatic, and the factors bound there. So we call those differentially bound domains deep, deep, or regions. So, okay, that suggested that for this profound sulfate change, uh, K9 trimethyl was the dominant block. And then later, we prevailed upon Li Jianhui's beautiful work, where they were uh, doing a, a direct reprogramming or direct conversion of the same kind of fibroblasts into human-induced hepatic cells. And this is work that we repeated of theirs in my own lab. And Justin Becker made the following observation, that if you take the liver genes, the genes that are on in liver, um, and ask, what's their chromatin state in the starting human fibroblasts? The genes that were in the H3K9 trimethyl basically failed to activate after reprogramming or activate well. They were essentially the block, whereas genes that were in K9, K27 trimethyl or unmarked uh, with respect to these marks activated pretty well. So that has led our lab to uh, be very focused on H3K9 trimethyl heterochromatin. We've published on biochemical isolation of all these proteins in there and now functional work, which I will not discuss. But just carrying on now with the, um, the work that I've been talking about, uh, we next asked, uh, when can we observe changes in the H3K9 trimethyl heterochromatin? And I would have thought, well, sure, we'll see something early on. But in fact... Um, if we look now, this is work done by Jing Chao Zhang and, and Greg Donahue in the lab. And here we're using TRA160 magnetic isolation of cells to pull down uh, TRA160 negative, not reprogramming, versus positive reprogramming, and then doing CHIP for K9 trimethyl and adding uh, Drosophila chromatin as a spike in control. So here are two of those differential bound domains. And you can see in fibroblasts in this, you know, this is uh, a dozen years later, we see the, nice, the same exact 
uh, H3K9 trimethyl chip results. And in the cells that are TRA160 negative, this stuff doesn't really budge. In the 160 positive, this one kind of doesn't budge. This one seems to be thinning out a little bit. Um, but the key point is we see that global chromatin opening while we still have extensive K9 trimethyl uh, modification of the chromatin. So our perspective is that it's at least this form of heterochromatin doesn't explain it. So what might? So uh, we went back to the you know, drawing board and actually thinking back of Mel De, to Mel de Pamphilus's work on uh, looking at linker histone vari you know, sub variants in um, early development. Now linker histone helps maintain chromatin compaction. It's perfectly suited for what we're kind of looking for. And uh, my lab and Miguel Beato's lab and um, others now, as summarized in the last uh, review, have observed um, when nu factors bind nucleosomes, they can displace uh, linker histone. Although I must say it's not a very mature field at this point. But in any case, what, there's also this H1 subtype. So there's seven or eight different subtypes of linker histone. The H1 subtype is a, a somatic subtype and it's replication independent. There are many others. But what uh, Jing Chao observed is that by day four, if you express SOX2 even a little bit, you don't express H10. It gets silenced. And then uh, we also did uh, chip seek with a pan linker histone antibody. So it's way, there's a lot more going on than H10. But what I find interesting is, first of all, notice that the H1 just sort of goes up and down. It's not you know, confined to these heterochromatic domains, but as predicted by ENCODE, it's almost all over. And we haven't figured this all out, but what I will say is that each track looks different to us. Um, so there's some dynamic or some changes going on. Uh, in the linker histone in early reprogramming. It's basically the only clue we have for something within those first few days. And it's happening apparently globally. All right, so what about the next phase when we get to day seven and beyond? So as I had said before, we don't see much happening to um, H3K9 trimethyl at the genome level. And if we look at immunostaining uh, for H3K9 trimethyl, you can see, you know, maybe there's something going on. I don't know, it's hard to say, but uh, not a whole lot. Until we look in the cells that are reprogramming at day seven and beyond, and lo and behold, dramatic difference. So the heterochromatin is reorganized and it, it falls into these blobs, if you will. Um, and that's um, really a, a striking result. So to summarize, we think that there's phases of global chromatin transitions that you kind of only see if you're looking with um, global techniques, if you will. So first, we think that the um, linker histone changes are probably related to the global opening of the chromatin that we observe. We have not proven it, but we have some genetic approaches uh, moving forward. Uh, there's this global decompaction. Then there's this K9 trimethyl reorganization that's occurring around here. And finally, there's loss of K9. Um, there, I'm sorry, there's loss of the compacted chromatin at the nuclear periphery. So um, if we kind of summarize this in a different way, uh, there's global decompaction. And coming back to the beginning of the talk, when I discussed how these um, pioneer factors can target nucleosomes and need to scan the nucleosomes, we think it's pretty straightforward, perhaps, that these factors scanning the nucleosomes in great abundance loosen things up and maybe displace linker histones in the process, leading to a global decompaction. And that enables additional events that uh, elicit this heterochromatin reorganization and we also think, uh, based on the work from, again, Catherine Plath and others, that uh, these early binding events, this pioneering is not necessarily setting up the genetic network per se of the pluripotent cells, 
but rather is enabling that to be set up by just being disruptive in, in a general and perhaps non-specific way. And then later, there's sort of transactivation by these factors. And there's a whole host of papers that have come out now who've done more careful time course studies than we have, where they look at uh, nucleosome targeting pioneer factors over time and have routinely seen now that uh, you can discern by half a day-ish, you can see the factors targeting these silent sites and you're not getting chromatin opening for another half day or so. So what I wonder is if there's a role for global chromatin dynamics in um, other uh, cell fate changes and maybe metastable changes um, in animals and in development. So that's my talk. Uh, John Lerner, uh, fantastic uh, collaborator and postdoc. He's now an assistant professor at Midwestern University. Jing Chao Zhang, a postdoc in my lab. Greg Donahue, a computational and statistician person uh, who's been great. Melike Lacadimali and Paolo Gomez Garcia at CRG Barcelona um, have been helpful, as have James Liu and Luke Levis. And thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. First question already popping up here. Ken, thank you so much for a beautiful talk. I love the, the global look. Uh, the question I have is, um, when you're talking about this decompaction, are you specifically talking about, uh, your, your, the metric I think you're using is actually mobility. Is that correct? Sorry, it's hard. Is it, is the, oh, there we go. Uh, is the metric you're using is mobility of H2B based on your halo? Yes. And so do you mean that the, by global decompaction that you're actually seeing more movement overall? Yes. And that would not then, which is sort of different than the actual compact state. So you don't actually see a change in the uh, uh, approximate area or volume of the cell. Or do you see a change in the volume, sorry, specifically right. of the nucleus? Um, we're not seeing a change in the volume of the nucleus. I, I wouldn't say we've looked at it carefully, but if there was something there, we probably would have seen it. But what, we've, what we're doing is we're kind of partitioning the um, H2B mobility, H2B in nucleosomes, into two classes, confined mobility and less confined. And that's how we're defining it. Now, John, in our original paper in 2020, he had five different ways of parsing it out in a lot more detail. But this seems to be the, a perfectly suitable way to, to look at it based on how he divided the mobile versus not. Does that answer the question? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. It does answer the question. I think what you're seeing, well, what I would describe the global decompaction as given if you have a same volume is like a fluidization almost. But we can talk about oh, that I later. See. Yeah, so, um, well... I mean, if the, if the motion tracks of the, of the molecules or of the nucleosomes are markedly larger than they were before, we would say that they're, it's being decompacted. It's not as constrained. But you're right. We need to be careful of the language. Josh. So as you look at the non-reprogrammed cells, and you see that initially you get a lot of mobility, but then you get this reduction. And, and when you start, you have regions where there is high mobility in the in the somatic cell, right? And so I wonder when you say that this is about global reorganization, is it just an average that you're talking about? Because there are regions that are always going to not be mobile because actually right. when you look at your reprogrammed cells, you do have these regions that retain new mobility over time. And then I wonder what is it you would think causes these regions to retain that? immobility, and this is just a characteristic of the S cells, for example. Right. So if I understand the question, you're saying, um, what about the regions that don't change? Uh, like, for example, the nuclear periphery doesn't change its compacted mobility in those first four days. So why are, why are those resistant? Is that Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. and then when you're talking about whether there's a global change, is it that, you know, ES cells or you know, are a state that has a lot of open chromatin. Therefore, there's a lot of mobility there. So is this just a characteristic, characteristic of the fact that you've got this enhanced mobility in these cells anyway, because there's so much open chromatin around and the linker histones are displaced, or it, and that there are still loci where this doesn't occur? Or is it that there's something really global that's happened to all the chromatin, and for some reason, right. there are... So... I mean, it's not happening to all the chromatin. We don't think histones are being displaced because you can tell by the particulars of how the, they move in, 
it's in more detail in the papers that it's still in chromatin. Um, but coming back to your point, uh, I think that, um, so we now know that these pioneer factors uh, can be resistant to targeting um, HVK9 domains or polycomb domains. And actually, Andy Katznelson, a student in my lab, his thesis project is to figure out which factors can target this kind of heterochromatin versus that. And he sees very clear differences among the different factors that we were testing. So what I suspect is that analogous to the um, DBRs that Abdenour first found, there's regions in fibroblasts that these factors are not touching. And those would be the blue domains, the compacted constrained domains that are not changing, but the vast majority of the rest of it is. Question over there. I can illuminate in talk. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. The first one in the decompaction reversal of the cells that do not undergo the path to IPS reprogramming. Have you had the chance to try other pioneer factors, not the Amanaka factors? Right. And whether then you see this decompaction that you see with the Yamanaka factors. And the second is, is this cell, when they, they come back, they come back, back, go to the similar cell you started with, or you feel that this is a different cell, so to speak, from the initial one that you added the, right. the factors? Thank so you. Very, very good questions. I'll, I'll try to answer the second one first, which is after the cells... Uh, the cells that are not on the path to reprogramming, uh, which exhibit a, a lot more mobile chromatin in four days, and then it seems to be gone in seven days. Uh, we don't know much more about those cells, although we've now been doing chip on them, and, and further analysis might reveal something. But um, we don't know if they are in some special state or a metastable state for a while, and it could be that they are, and we, we just haven't followed that up. With regard to whether other uh, factors or pioneer factors elicit this, uh, we haven't yet done, I know it seems obvious and why haven't we, but we haven't <laughs> and we've been focusing on this. Uh, so we have you know, the factors that reprogram fibroblasts to liver and, and various others now under study and we haven't done the H2B. You know, so one of the questions is the H2B halo. One of the questions is whether one factor alone can do this or you need a group of them that genetically has a, is known to have a strong effect. Um, I can tell you that we've had, we have tested OSK Sendai viruses and uh, CMYK independently. And if we have them separate, we do not get the dramatic chromatin opening that we observed. So uh, then we've also tested whether it's increased cell division that might be induced by CMYK or whatever. And the increased cell division is not solely induced by CMYK that we observe. It's induced by all the factors. So we think that it could be an increased cell division that's part of this. And actually, that's led us to a path to looking at some of the histone chaperones and linker histone chaperones in um, their role in this process. And so... Um, that's kind of where we're going right now. Actually, my question was almost uh, answered, but I would like to ask another question then so about the heterochromatic. So, original sulfate, right? To, mm -hmm. to turn, you would need heterochromatin reorganization. Um, and just to clarify, do you mean that what you're showing is going beyond that? Or is the purpose of this to mainly get rid of the original starting sulfate of the fibroblast uh, gene expression now? So if I understand the question, uh, I mean, e embryonic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells and blastocyst cells have heterochromatin. It's just not remotely as, as uh, constrained and tight as what we've observed in somatic cells but they still have K9 domains, they still have K27 domains. Interestingly, knockouts of uh, SETDB1, I think, and perhaps SU39, uh, you, you lose the ability to uh, self-renew pluripotent cells, although knocking out the polycomb does not affect self-renewal, but they affect uh, differentiation. So you need some level of heterochromatin in pluripotent cells, and we don't see it completely going away, 
we see we still see you know blue dots or whatever as i've shown here but i think no one would really expect or am i wrong no one would really expect them to go away because I mean, they have to be silenced, right? And you would expect that some hit the point. You should be there. That, that's the reorganization. Sure. I mean, well, like I said, um, pluripotent stem cells have plenty of heterochromatin that's silencing, you know, fibroblast genes here, neural cells there, or what have you. Um, so it, you are reusing the components, but you're, you know, I mean, this was um, Mistelli and Mesherore's original observation of this hyperdynamic business. Um, and uh, there's clearly a functional difference that you can observe lab to lab. So it's the way it works. We're, we're, actually, uh, we're actually knocking in halo tag into one of the mouse H2B loci to ask these questions in natural embryonic development. And so I think that'll be insightful as well. I probably have a strange question, <laughs> and this is whether you took into account the sex of the cells, because if you have female cells, you would have, unless you have naive pluripotent stem cells, you would have uh, a lot of heterochromatin caused by the inactive X chromosome, and I wonder whether you saw differences there when you look at male and female cells, or whether you didn't right. take this into account. So, since these are foreskin fibroblast cells, they're definitely male. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, we actually collaborated with um, Catherine Plath and looked. We did one of these heterochromatin isolations that we we do with a female cell line that she had, and uh, we see kind of. I mean, except for the X, we see very similar heterochromatin parameters for the female line as we did for the male cells that we've worked with. So I don't know if there's a global difference besides the X chromosome. Okay, on that note, I will keep all my questions for over a beer then. <laughs> and let's thank Ken for a fantastic talk. <laughs>